After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled it, a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Luke now inserts between that and bowing his head and gave up the spirit, these words. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. These last statements of Jesus on the cross, I thirst, it is finished, and Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He, he says these last words at the end of six hours, the, the three last hours Darkness has been over the land, and now that darkness is dispelling, and the light again is beginning to shine, and he says them before all of those who have mocked him throughout his crucifixion, and their mocking goes on to the very end of his suffering. Just prior to this, at the end of these three hours of darkness, and the end of this six hours in which he hung upon the cross, Christ has cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And those who are surrounding the cross take this moment again to offer up their mocking against him. They say, oh, he's calling for Elijah, even though it's clear, it's clear that that is not what he was saying. They add to it, they add that claim to their mocking and their jesting beneath the cross and these last three declarations that the Lord Jesus makes are, in a sense, an answer to their accusations. God has not cast him off. God has not ignored him. He is who he declared himself to be. He is their Messiah, and he is responding to them, particularly and uniquely and thoughtfully, in these last three statements. It would, uh, if you look at these three statements, it would seem to some extent, as we're saying here, that they were calculated, that they were less spontaneous than the other statements that we understand the Lord Jesus spoke from the cross. As they're nailing him to the cross and he is, the nails are being driven through him, he out from his pain spontaneously cries out the heart of compassion saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. As he's hanging upon the cross and... Um, the thief who is beside him comes to faith in him and confesses his own sin and calls upon the Lord Jesus to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. The Lord Jesus responds to this evidence of repentance and faith and belief in him by saying, assuredly, I say to you this very day, you'll be with me in paradise. Just as he is descending into the great suffering that he will experience for a cross, he, he gazes down at his mother and his apostle John who is standing next to her and he pauses as he's entering to this time of suffering to arrange some family business to provide for her. And he says, woman, behold thy son, pointing to John or directing her to John. And to John, he says, uh, brother or John, behold thy mother. We're told from that time on that, uh, the two, that Mary went and lived in the home of John and was cared for by John. Now he goes through the agonies and the experience of the cross and the darkness of the cross and in the heat of that darkness and at the pit of the suffering that he experiences for our sake upon the cross as he descends into the deepest part of the deep well of our sin and its punishment and he goes to the bottom of that dark suffering where all the light of God's presence is drawn away from him and the father turns his face, he spontaneously replies or cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You can see in all these first four statements, in a sense, there is some sense of spontaneity in what the Lord Jesus says. It's not crafted. It's not developed for an effect. It is drawn out from him in this spontaneous fashion. And yet now when we turn to these other passages, these other statements, these last three, three statements, we should see that there is something that the Lord Jesus is revealing. They are 
less, uh, they are less spontaneous and more cal- calculated. They drive home to those around that the Lord Jesus has been in full control of all that is taking place. He is not a victim. He's a victor. He's not experiencing an accident of history. He is accomplishing a great work of salvation. His words are spoken in such a way that they leave a mark on all of those who have been mocking him at the foot of the cross. He's not on the cross as a pathetic figure. He's there as an empathetic figure. He's there because he's gone there for their sakes. He's there for your salvation and my salvation. And so this morning what I want to do is I want to take note of this controlled expression and the meaning of these last three words of Jesus Christ. Turn back to John chapter 19 verse 28. And uh, I want you to, in understanding the composure and the calculated nature of what the Lord Jesus is saying, I want you to see it framed for us in this uh, verse 28 of John 19. And we'll consider it a little bit more, but there's a word I want to underscore for you. It says this, after Jesus, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished in your Bible, you might just go and circle that word accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now it's true that this idea that the Lord just said, I thirst, is in part a fulfillment of Scripture. Psalm 69, verse 21, says this. The psalmist writes, For my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. There's a pretty wonderful fulfillment of the declaration, I thirst. Jesus says, I thirst. In response to this declaration, I thirst, one of the soldiers takes sour wine that is at the foot of the cross. That would be just common wine that was drunk by the soldiers in those days. It was probably there for themselves. They dip a a sponge in that wine. They put it on a hyssop stalk, lift it up to his lips, and he drinks from it. There is here a fulfillment of Scripture. But I think it's best to understand this phrase, that the Scripture should be fulfilled, doesn't introduce the statement, Jesus said, I thirst. It doesn't simply modify the statement, Jesus said, I thirst. Instead, it's most likely that this phrase, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, is modifying this statement, Jesus knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. You see that? And that's the point of emphasis. Actually, John uses this phrase, that the scripture might be fulfilled, at least on three other occasions in his gospel. And on each of those occasions, that statement is modifying what he has just said what has gone before, not what comes after. Now, it's likely that it includes both. (laughs) It includes the declaration, I thirst, but it also includes everything that's taking place up to this point on the cross. Everything that was accomplished at the cross, in other words, was a fulfillment of everything that the scripture was pointed to in regard to God's plan of redemption and God's purpose in sending his Messiah. And if you understand it that way, then you'll see that the last three declarations or statements that Jesus makes is in response to what he knows has been accomplished and that he knows scripture has been fulfilled in relation to his mission. In other words, you might read it this way as you consider these three verses. Jesus, knowing that everything had now been accomplished to fulfill what scriptures taught concerning his mission, said, and then we read these various statements, starting with the statement, I thirst. If you understand it that way, then what he says here is like a capstone of all that he's done. What he says here is a declaration to all those who have been questioning and mocking him before the cross, a declaration of his conquest and of his victory. And so he says first, and let's look at this first, I thirst, I thirst. Jesus has uh, come out of a great work of suffering on the cross. God's just wrath and punishment against sin has been poured out upon him. The sinless Savior has become sin for us, and as such, he's entered into our judgment. And that judgment is, in essence, the removal of God's ministering presence from our lives. It's spiritual death, and the Bible says that all have sinned, and that that sin separates us from a holy God, and left to its course the cause and ultimate 
movement of sin is an ever-deepening separation that will lead us to a final point of unending separation from God. And this alienation increasingly moves a person further and further away from the satisfying goodness of God, and it will end with them being one day completely removed from any light and any refreshing from God's own goodness. And that's what hell is. It is the anguish of an unquenchable thirst. And while Jesus is on the cross, he has entered into the anguish of the sentence that we deserve. You remember in John chapter 4 when the Lord Jesus was meeting with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, and he asked her to draw water for him, and she questioned the propriety of him asking her, a Samaritan woman, such a question. And then he said, if you knew who it was who was talking to you, you would ask of me, and I would give you water that you could drink so you would never thirst again. And she joked with him, saying, well, then give me that water so I never have to come to this well again. And he says to her that he is able to give her water that she may drink that would well up within her to everlasting life. This is what God's presence ultimately is. This is what heaven is. Heaven is the ever satisfying outpouring of the life and the water and the refreshing of God's own goodness. And hell is just the opposite. And so in Luke chapter 16, the Lord Jesus tells the story of a rich man who dies and goes into Hades, or what we might in our minds conceptualize or understand to be hell. And there in this place of torment and suffering, the rich man cries across and calls out. He's in this place in which he cannot experience God's goodness. And he cries out for someone to come and to merely dip their finger in water and come and lay their wet finger upon his tongue for he says he's in great torment. That's what hell is. It's this place where his thirst and his suffering is bringing him to torment, and he's told at that time that his suffering can't be quenched. It remains forever. And in our passage, Jesus is just coming out of the fire of our own hell, having suffered as the Son of Man and the Son of God the everlasting weight of our sin's punishment and our great thirst. And as he comes out, the residue of that suffering, he calls out, I thirst, I thirst. The suffering he has endured is beyond our imagination. But the thirst is real. And the thirst is not only spiritual, but physical. I believe the father knew that the suffering of his son was over at that moment and that it was complete and that the father invited his son to the drink of life of his own felt and renewed presence and said to him in essence, drink, your work is accomplished. He said this last week, when you're engaged in a, a, a task, a job, some labor that you have to intensely focus upon, some mission or job that you're doing to um, lift or move or haul away something in your house or your backyard. There were some years ago in which I had to uproot a number of roots in the back of my yard and a tree and you know it was quite a bit of labor but once you start at it you don't want to stop partly for me if I stop doing these kinds of labor my back will seize up I can't you know while it's limber while I've loosened up I just got to go at it so you're going at it and you're going at it and you're going at it and you know I think it's going to take you 15 minutes and it's 30 minutes and then it's maybe another 10 minutes and then it's you're two and a half hours or two hours into it and finally the job is done and when the job is done you realize how thirsty you are you go and you drink in because you've completed your task and your job. And in a sense, we might see here that the Lord Jesus is drinking in the relief of all the labors that he's experienced and all the suffering that he's endured. What we could say is because Jesus took on the work that left him thirsty with the suffering for our sins, we may, as a result, receive the gift of everlasting water and drink it in and never thirst again. But that said... I think the Lord Jesus is addressing in this moment a very real physical impact of suffering on the cross for six hours. When he went to the cross, he was offered vinegar or sour wine with gall that was mixed in it to dull the pain and dull his experience, and he wouldn't take it. 
He was willing to suffer and experience all the pain that was coming upon him, and he didn't want his wits dulled by what was given to him, but, but now he needs something to drink because he has something to do still. He has something that he's going to cry out, and before he cries out, he has to bring moisture into his mouth and into his throat and into his voice box. He, he needs a, 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 a voice to proclaim. Actually, Matthew and Mark and Luke all tell us that just before the legion, Lord Jesus died, he cried out with a loud voice. Now, that's kind of interesting. If you understand the ministry of the Lord Jesus, you'll see many times that he's preaching through great multitudes, thousands of people. The, he had to have tremendous control. I, I have the help of a, look, what do we have? A handful of people here, and I've got a microphone on so you can all hear well. The Lord Jesus spoke to thousands of people in the amphitheater, people surrounding him without any help or assistance or amplification, but the power of his voice. He had to have a powerful voice when he taught. We don't read that he shouted when he preached. He just had command over his voice. But now they say he gave out a loud cry. This is even beyond the projection of his voice when he's preaching to thousands of people. A loud cry, but for that moment, for that loud cry to go out, he, he needed a drink so he could speak as loudly and plainly as possible the concluding words of his work that he had been engaged in on the cross. And so that drink of sour wine is given to him. And the Lord now has two more things to say. So here's the second one. He says, it is finished. It is finished. What does that mean? What could that stand for? We could understand that in the sense that when you come to the end of some kind of difficult challenge, you, you've finished and you've gone through the passage of that labor and work. You know, it used to be that people paid off their mortgage and they spent a lot of time working and laboring to pay off the mortgage in their home and when they finally paid off the mortgage in their home there was a deed or title that was given or, and they took that old mortgage statement they had and they brought their friends all over and they set it on fire and they all celebrated that they had paid off their mortgage and it was done. And nowadays, you know, you have a child and the child goes through uh, school and he finishes all of his classes and he comes to the end of the 12th year and when he's finished the course of their education, or she's finished the course, you, you have a big graduation party because they've finished. And oftentimes you're actually not celebrating that they've completed their work with any proficiency. Sometimes they got by by the skin of their teeth, but you celebrate, it's done. It's uh, for parents you celebrate. I, I remember we had uh, one of our children in particular. You know, the rule here is if you, you miss something like two weeks of school, after that you, you can't go to school anymore. You've got to, that's all that you can have missed. And and then you have to repeat over again. And this child had the habit of taking it down to the last day always. So the last two months of school, it was everything to get them to school so that they didn't have to repeat it. We had to get them out of the house. You had to wake them up in the morning, take them. And it was just, so when it was done and they finally graduated, there was a great relief. It's finished. <laughs> you know, she's graduated. We don't have to drag her out of bed and take her to school and make sure she goes to bed early enough. And now well, that's it human response it makes sense that the Lord Jesus might be saying in a sense and celebrating I'm done the labor is over the work is done the the life with no place to lay my head the sorrows and the burdens and the fatiguing travel travel throughout the land and my time here on earth is over my time of enduring and sharing in the sorrows of this age is over I'm done with my assignment it's finished it would be an entirely human and appropriate response. But I think that is a limited understanding of what these words are saying. The truth is that what the Lord is saying here is encompassing a work that is so deep and so profound and so wonderful that will never come to an end of grasping what he is saying when he says, to tell us die, it is finished. It is too grand and it's too wonderful, but... We'll begin here. We'll go back to verse 28. Remember I told you to circle the word accomplished in verse 28? Well, the word it is finished is the exact same word. Jesus, knowing that everything has been accomplished according to the scriptures, said, it has been accomplished. It is finished. He takes a survey of all that he's fulfilled and all that he's answered and all that was anticipated and all that was set forward in the scriptures of God's redemptive plan and God's redemptive work to draw sinful people back into relationship with himself. 
And then the Lord Jesus goes and dives into that great work and gives himself fully in order to redeem us from our sins. For this to take place first, all of the requirements of the law had to be kept by him so that he might establish us in his complete and other righteousness. Throughout his whole life, he meticulously fulfilled every measure of the law. Not one jot or tittle passed away from him without him fully addressing it in perfect sinlessness and righteousness. Scrupulously, he offered up to the Father at the cross all of his perfect righteousness. The law completely fulfilled in himself as it's required of us. But we've not fulfilled that law. We've broken it. We've sinned. And as a result, we've brought upon ourselves the punishment of that sin a punishment that separates us from God and a punishment that re- demands the requirement of our payment for that sin. And the Lord Jesus in his perfect righteousness then enters into our sin and makes the payment for us and dies on our behalf and bears the sin that we've committed on himself. And there he pays the price for our sins in order that we might be redeemed and forgiven of that sin, in order that we might then being redeemed and forgiven of that sin might be established before God, covered or receiving upon ourselves all of his righteousness. And the law is perfectly fulfilled in him. And that great work is accomplished. It is completed. It is completely and totally finished in himself. And so 2 Corinthians 5.21 needs to be understood in light of this declaration of the Lord Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin for us. There he is making the payment for our sins in order that we might become the righteousness of God in in Him. There He is giving us His perfect, fulfilled righteousness according to the law, that righteousness which is required for anyone to enter into fellowship with God. And the Lord Jesus has provided it all for us, and He's telling it out with a shout of victory that it's accomplished, It's, it's, it's finished. All through the Old Testament, we see the development of a system of worship that was established as the base that taught the people what was necessary for them to come into the presence of God. It was necessary that a sinless, perfect sacrifice be made on their behalf for their sinfulness, that a payment be made for yourself for your sins. And if there wasn't a payment made for yourself, a vicarious payment made in your place, a sacrifice in your place for your sins, and if that didn't take place, then you must pay for it yourself with your own life. And this was repeated over and over and over again in the various sacrifices and the various details and the intricate level in which this system was applied and carried out around the temple with its altar and with its sacrifices and with its priesthood and with its various ceremonies and the various types of sacrifices were made. It was demonstrating to them that it was an undertaking, a great, significant, intricate, extensive undertaking to deal with their sin. Removing their sin from their life was not a trite thing or an easy thing. It wasn't accomplished by the wink of God's eyes. A holy God required an extensive work that thoroughly addressed all the ways in which sin had complicated their lives, in which sin had interfered with their relationship with others, and in which sin had interfered and removed them from a significant relationship with God. But that system was only taught. It was only a way in which uh, it pointed to a requirement that the system itself could not fully deliver. It didn't deliver once for all what was needed. And so these rituals were repeated over and over and over again as an illustration that the challenge of sin still remained. The problem had not been fully addressed. They still had to look to God for an ultimate solution to the problem of their sin. In the temple, between what was called the holy place and the most holy place was a veil or a curtain On it were the images embroidered of two cherubim with great swords. You might remember when Adam and Eve sinned, they were driven out of the garden and at the face of the garden so they could not enter back into the presence of God where they had walked with God, replaced two angels, two cherubim with flaming swords. And that experience and that reality is emblazoned on these veils, or these veil, this veil that separates the holy place from the most holy place. And it is a veil representing the sin of the people. And the consequence of that sin that it, it guards them from coming into the presence of a holy God. If they went there, they would be consumed. They would sacrifice their lives. Just once a year, the high priest on the Day of Atonement was able to enter into that most holy place and there offer sacrifice for the people. And only then he could go, 
having been covered by the blood of an innocent lamb that had suffered and been sacrificed. Only go under the covering of the righteousness or the innocency or the purity of something that had suffered and died in the place of him and all the nation. It's again teaching the people that there was a great work that still had to be accomplished, that sin and the issue of sin had not been completely dealt with, that in all the sacrifice and everything that it offered, it had not been brought to its completion. It had not been finished. And yet in the moment when the Lord Jesus had finished his suffering, in the moment in which he is preparing to cry out, it is finished, it has been accomplished, Luke tells us that the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. And everything had been done and fulfilled. And everything had been removed so that we could have our sins completely forgiven. The debt had been paid for all that we had done, received by Jesus himself. The righteousness required to come into the presence of holy God had been bestowed upon us by him. And all who might receive what he had offered and all that received the gift that he made at that moment may embrace and find themselves alive in his victorious shout. It is finished. It has been accomplished. All that was anticipated was met in Jesus Christ. John the Baptist anticipated it. When he saw the Lord Jesus walking along the shore of the Jordan River, he pointed to him and said, Look, or behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Lord Jesus himself anticipated this moment and this accomplishment. He said that he didn't come to serve or, or to be served, but to serve and to give himself a ransom, a payment for many. The author of Hebrews, looking upon the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ, says in Hebrews 9, 28, these words, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. And to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin to bring salvation. It's done. It's been made. Once and for all, it's been made. Peter puts it this way, reflecting on the finished work of Jesus Christ, Christ on the cross. He says in 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ has also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that, we, that he might bring us to God. It's finished. The work is complete. The mockers had called for Jesus to come down from the cross to prove that God loved him. Jesus would not come down from the cross. He remained upon it in order to prove that the Father loved us and loved them. He accomplished their salvation. He accomplished our salvation by suffering completely for our sins and replacing our defilement with his perfect righteousness so that redeemed, bought back from ruin, we might come into a relationship with God. Paul, reflecting on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, puts it this way. He loved me, and he gave himself for me. That's what the cross is. By the way, here's an application for us. This is, by the way, a statement in Scripture that you can never cease to meditate on. You will never know the fullness of all that Christ accomplished for you on the cross. But here's an application for you. There is nothing left for you to do to earn your salvation from God. Nothing. Nothing. There is nothing left for you to do in order to live in reconciled peace with God, but to accept that Jesus has paid it all, that he's done it all, that he's finished and accomplished the work on your behalf. Now, how hard is that? It's very hard. <laughs> because all of our lives... All of our lives, we've lived our lives earning things and deserving things and acquiring things with our wiles. And we've been able to do all those things. And having done all those things, we basically come to a point where we can somehow say to ourselves, I've earned it. I deserve this. I've gained it. I did this. But not this. Not this. Not being right with God. Not having your sins forgiven and paid for. You can't earn it. You didn't earn it. The Lord Jesus did it all. And it's required of us only one thing, that we are to confess this truth and believe that it's true and to receive what he freely gives us. And receiving it, to demonstrate that we truly believe it, we have to stop trying to earn it. We have to stop trying to deserve it. We have to stop trying to gain it. We have to stop doing it for ourselves. It's a contradiction 
to what he's done and what he's given us, freely given to us. We're to live in the freedom of what he freely has given us at his own expense, eternal life. We're to live in the freedom of what he's freely offered up to us and simply drink in what he gives us. Yesterday, uh, men were meeting for a, a breakfast time and we were talking about what is it that we have that we truly receive freely because the fact is if you start thinking about it and calculating it, almost everything that you take up in life, in some way you think you did something to get it for yourself. Well, we came up with one thing, air, air. You just breathe it in. You don't earn it. You didn't do anything for it. You just breathe it in. That's what faith is. Faith is the lungs of trust and belief that just takes in what Jesus has offered freely of himself and rest in it. And in, in it lives and thrives and goes forward. And it's all been finished, it's all been accomplished. You don't have to earn it. Eternal life is yours. Forgiveness of sins is yours. Fellowship with God is yours forever. It's been accomplished. You just receive it and breathe it in. Here's the third thing the Lord Jesus says. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. My understanding is when he shouted, he shouted out, it is finished. And Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I think these came in quick succession. The Lord Jesus Words on the cross began at the beginning of his crucifixion with the statement, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. In the middle of his agonies, he doesn't call out and say, Father. He says, my God, my God. But now he's back to addressing God as Father. And the son commits himself to God saying, Father, into your hands. And in this moment, the Lord Jesus, who has entered into our spiritual death and borne the wrath and judgment of God's sin, upon our, our death, is now not giving himself over to eternal death. He's now just simply giving himself over to physical death. And for him, it's not a penalty. For him, it's a moment in which he just lays himself down into the arms of his Father. For those who live in the accomplished redemption that Jesus has made for us at the cross, dying for our sins, and giving us freely his righteousness, and by faith we take hold of that and believe that, physical death is not a punishment anymore. It's just a moment in which we give ourselves over to, and we rest ourselves in the hands of the all-powerful and almighty God. In fact, the Bible says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We've said this plenty of times, but we're not a body with a spirit. We're spirits with a body. And when I give my life to the Lord Jesus, he claims my spirit and I'm bound and to him. And the day in which I leave this body behind, ah, I'll be in the arms of my Savior. I'll be in the hands of my God. The author of Hebrews tells us in 1031 that it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. But it was not for Jesus. It was not for Jesus. And it's not for those who've come into the death that Jesus Christ has given for them and into the life that he is providing for them. There is something interesting in what Jesus is saying here, though. There's an element in Jesus' words that none of us could ever say. Look to John chapter 10 for a moment, if you'll turn there. When Jesus says what he says, uh, into your hands I commit my spirit, John tells us right after that that he gave up the ghost. We'll think about that in just a second. We have to understand it in light of what he says here in John chapter 10. John chapter 10, let me read to you verses 17 and 18. He, he actually makes this statement before the same religious leaders who are now assembled beneath his cross and have been mocking him throughout these six hours. He says these incredible words. My father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. What a boast is that? Not one of us could say something like that. We don't have the control over our lives and we don't have control over our deaths and at any moment our deaths can come to an end suddenly, unexpectedly. And once we die, we have no power to bring ourselves back into life. But Jesus claimed all the power was his, both to live, give his life at the moment of his own choosing and to take it up by his own power. 
It's kind of interesting that the crucifixion, crucifixion was set up in such a way that it would extract out as long as possible a person's death to make it as miserable and difficult as possible. And it usually took a healthy middle-aged man, a man in his 30s, Jesus' age. It would take them uh, three or four days to expire on the cross. The Lord Jesus hung on the cross for six hours. Short compared to anyone else. In fact, everyone was shocked they died so suddenly. But it's because he had control over how and where and when and at what moment he would die. And he is expressing in this moment his power. His life, in this sense, was not taken from him. He gave it up for us. He dies of his own will and choosing. And here the Lord determines the very moment of his death. He, he won't hang on that cross for another day or two, not even for another minute. He calls out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then John tells us that Jesus bowed his head and gave up the spirit, or gave up the ghost, you'll see in the old King James. And by the way, that's the only place where death is described in that way. None of us willfully give up the spirit. It's just given up. This is an expression of the power of the Lord Jesus to determine the exact moment in which he turns out his spirit to the Father as he gives himself up on the cross. It's only spoken of it. It can only be spoken of Jesus Christ. He had complete mastery over himself and over his death and the exact moment of the time of his departure. And he gave himself into death and his spirit was given over by him at that time. The entire time, the other thing you might say here, it says he bowed his head and died. You can see the picture. I actually know what that looks like because sometimes when I'm preaching, I've not seen people die, but I've seen them bow their heads on their chest on different occasions, right? So I know what that would look like. It's, but it tells us something. The, the whole time that the Lord Jesus has been on the cross, he's looked through it with his face straight ahead. He's endured the pain and the suffering, looking out upon those that he's suffering for straight ahead the whole time. But the moment comes when he consigns himself to the Father and his spirit to the Father. And immediately as the word comes out from his mouth, his head goes down upon his chest and he's gone. There's no lingering departure, no struggle to turn over to the other side, no slow death. Immediately he goes into the arms of his Father. Now, Again, put yourself at the cross. You've been mocking him. Now, with full vigor, with a shout louder than he's ever cried out before, he shouts out, Tetelestai! It is finished! It is accomplished! Father, into your hands I commit my spirit! And then his head goes on his chest, and he's gone. And he's gone. What a shocking experience. As they all watched on, no struggle to die, mm -hmm. such command. Right. Those around the cross, we're told, went to their homes after this moment, beating their chest. They're no longer ignorant of what had happened there, nor of who it was that hung upon that cross, not entirely. The Roman soldiers, they say in that moment, this was the Son of God, we're told. Uh, the, the centurion, that's, that's a declaration of who Jesus Christ was. The centurion says, this was a righteous man. That's a declaration of what they'd all done. They had just crucified a righteous man. What was left for them to do with that knowledge It was to repent and believe on him. Eventually, many of them did. Many of them did and were, and were forgiven. That's where we come to at the end of that moment. What a beautiful commanding picture of our Savior in the midst of his sufferings. Here's just a couple of questions for me. Have you fully claimed that finished work for yourself? Are you living in the promise that all of your salvation has been thoroughly and completely accomplished by Jesus Christ? Are you free from a life of earning and deserving with God? The sooner you're free from that, the quicker you can live a life of pleasing and delighting in Him instead. The sooner you can come with nothing left to do, no law to keep to earn your salvation, the sooner you'll get to uh, seeking out a standard to follow in order to simple, simply celebrate the free salvation that's yours. Here's another question. Are you ready for the day of your departing? Are you confident that you can 
in that hour, commit your life and your spirit in the hands of God and know that you'll wake up in His arms and in His presence. If not, you're only a gift to be received away. And when you receive that gift of the accomplished salvation of Jesus Christ on the cross for you, you begin to live forever. You drink in deeply, eternally, of everything He purchased for your sake at that place. It's all done. It's all done. And then there's just a song to be sung, a life to be lived, water to drink forever. Let's bow our heads.